Well, good evening, everybody. I do hope you can all hear me okay. And thank you ever so much for joining tonight's Virtual Fisheries Forum, all about tackling invasive species in London and the Southeast. So for those that don't know me, my name's Alex. I've been involved in organising fisheries forums like this for the Angling Trust for the last four years, both in person and online like tonight. So I think we've got um, quite a few familiar faces in the audience, but for the benefit of those that haven't come along uh, to one of these meetings before, you should all see at the bottom or the top of your screens, depending on the device that you're logging on from, a, a little Q&A button. And what you can do is you can hit that at any time throughout the course of the meeting, um, type in your questions. Those are then going to go through to us and we will then be able to answer them for you. Um, obviously, the meeting is going to be recorded, so um, you'll be able to circulate that recording with anyone that couldn't come along tonight and catch up on the actual presentation content as well. And we're also going to produce a written version of the Q&A document. Um, which will uh, be passed out alongside the presentation recordings. Uh, we've also got a very short survey, which will flash up on your screens uh, at the end of the meeting. Um, if you can just spare two or three minutes just to fill that out, it'd be uh, really helpful for us in terms of letting us know what you thought of it, um, what you liked about it and what you think we should do differently. So without further ado, I will introduce uh, some of our panelists for this evening so uh, if everyone can please switch their cameras on and turn their mics off um so obviously uh, we are invasive species focused tonight within the area we've uh, had apologies from canal and river trust but we're still joined by uh, colleagues from other organizations so first and foremost we've got uh, the angling trust's environment manager dr emily smith yeah, hi everyone. Oh, I always find it funny when you use that. Uh, Emily is fine. Uh, yeah, so I am the environment manager for the Angling Trust. So I am the national lead for us on invasive species, on litter, and also on our Love Fishing, Love Nature campaign. Thank you, Emily. And we've got um, Neil from the Environment Agency. Oh, I think you're on mute, Neil. Yeah, but I. The first mistake of the evening, there's going to be plenty more. Um, yes, hi, I'm Neil Hyder and I'm an angleholic, yeah. Um, now, I'm a technical specialist um, with the Environment Agency in Hearts North London and I work in the biodiversity team. Thank you very much, Neil. And moving to the left on my screen, we've got uh, Drew as well from the Angling Trust. Hello, I am Drew Chadwick. I'm the Environment Officer for the Angling Trust in the South, um, working alongside anglers and angling clubs, um, dealing with their invasive species, whatever they've got on site, and uh, promoting strict biosecurity throughout fisheries. Thank you, Drew. And we're also joined by Josh from the Wildlife Trust. Evening, everyone. Um, I'm, I do uh, water vole conservation and uh, invasive non-native species um, lead at the Trust, uh, working with colleagues. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, mink. Thank you very much, Josh. Um, so, yeah, so we've got a uh, fantastic range of expertise on the panel tonight. So feel free to ask um, any uh, scope of questions around um, invasive species or biosecurity, um, anything specific to the area. I, I should note as well, um, anything uh, outside of that range of topics, if you can please um, withhold them or uh, get in touch with us separately, we'll be happy to follow them up. But um, if we try and keep focus on the topic at hand, that would be fantastic. Um, so in terms of running order for tonight, we're going to start off with uh, a short piece that Emily has prepared, giving a uh, kind of um, yeah bigger overview of invasive species and biosecurity as a whole. Then um, Neil's going to talk to us a bit about floating pennywort, which I'm sure we're all uh, all too familiar with um, down in that part of the world. And then uh, Josh is going to follow up as well with um, a bit of information about mink. Um, but obviously, um, we've got, you know, as I say, some fantastic expertise on the panel. And please don't feel, um, yeah obliged to only ask on those very specific topics you know invasive species and biosecurity as a whole please do fire away so i think what i'll do now is emily i'm just going to pull up your uh piece and what we'll do is if we just run the three in order and then we'll have a kind of bigger q a piece um afterwards where we can all get stuck into a bit of discussion as i say please um pop your questions in the chat box throughout 
uh, and we will come to them uh, as soon as we can. One other um, point to note as well, we are down to finish for 8.30pm. Um, so if in the very unlikely event we don't get round to answering everybody's questions, then we will be happy to follow those up in writing afterwards. So um, I'm going to shut up now. And uh, I think if we just all uh, put ourselves on mute and turn the cameras off, I'll pull up these... Um, these first slides from Emily and uh, yeah, please sit back and enjoy. So before we get on to the presentations from our lovely speakers, I just wanted to include a short introduction to kind of cover the impact of invasive species, why we should care about them as the young community and what the practical action that we can do on the ground to help tackle this issue. Shawman, if you join the call today, are aware of what invasive species are, but I always include this at the start of my presentation just to make sure we're all uh, on the same page about what we're referring to. And the, the key thing here is invasive species are any species, plant, animal, or disease that's been introduced outside of its native range into new location. And in that area, it's now causing significant negative impacts, whether that's on human health, or on the economy or on the environment. So although sometimes we have people get in contact with us about blanket weeds or some duck weeds, and some of those would be seen as being invasive species if they're not from here, others are native species that are just very aggressive. So it's really important just to make that distinction and um, before we continue. So why should we care about them? What's the impact that invasive species have on fish and fishing as a whole? So there's over 200 invasive species in the UK, it's a huge number, and of course their impact is going to vary depending on that species and where they're found. But I've just included some of the main ones here that I think are relevant to us in the own community. So the obvious one is predation on fish stocks. So you have species such as signal crayfish, killer shrimp that will actively be predating on um, fry, on eggs. And where they have been found has resulted in a decrease in the recruitment of young um, in the spawning grounds of young juvenile populations. They can also introduce fish diseases, so I come on to topmouth gudgeon as an example in a little bit, um, but you can get diseases introduced that might not impact the invasive species itself, but then um, they act as more as hosts, so then introduce that disease will then have a significant impact on fish and might result in fish deaths or just real decreases in the quality of the fish. Another example of this is the sea louse that's currently in Norway. We're really fortunate that we don't have this species yet in the UK, um, but it's having huge impact and decimating uh, populations uh, in those rivers where it has invaded in Norway and other areas. Uh, another example is water flow and water quality. So if you're getting huge um, swathes of dense mats of plants, you can see in the top right there, these can block screens, block weirs, back up and cause the water level to rise and result in localised flooding. You can also get increases in sedimentation. So if they're again thinking of crayfish where they burrow into the banks, getting more deposits of sedment coming in, increased nutrient levels alongside that. And also uh, riparian plants such as Himalayan balsam, they die back in the winter, exposing the banks and there's no native plant there anymore. And again, it means that that sediment will just wash off straight into the river, into the water, increasing sediment loading, which will then impact spawning grounds, uh, as well as increasing localised nutrients. Uh, access issues. Uh, this is something that is not always in the immediate mindset sometimes um, when you kind of talk to people about invasive species. But if anyone knows if they've got any invasive plant, at their sites, just how devastating it can be and impacting on really important swims and really important sections um, of, of river. Uh, so you can see, again see the top right here where you've got a really dense mat of fishing pennywort growing and it's really hard to cast into that and really hard to, to then manage as well. Health and safety issues, so this is a, a real really important one. Um, showcasing it's not just the impact on the environment or um, on, on the economy, but actually some of these plants can impact your, yourselves um, or um, your members, obviously uh, kids, whoever it is that are interacting on the bank. So this is from giant hogweed. So if you just brush against uh, the leaves and the sap is photosensitive, so then means that that skin on exposure to light then creates these burning these blisters, which are really horrible and can come back year on year. 
So it's really important just to know what the species is and report it to make sure it can go out and be um, controlled and treated. And finally, um, just I uh, wanted to stress the, the impact that these invasive species can have on uh, the whole food chain and the habitat structure within a system. So you're getting, for example, these dense mats on the surface that will stop light getting through to the water column below, results in the native plants dying back, which means you'll have less shelter for the fish, uh, less shelter for invertebrates, so they will die back as well, so you have less food for the fish, and this has these knock-on consequences throughout. Um, so it's really important to kind of highlight that and really think about that when we're considering how this may impact the whole system which the, the fish are living in. And so I, I didn't want to go into this in too many details. As I said there's so many species that I could talk about. I just wanted to highlight um, uh, one or two in particular. And so this is topmouth gudgeon. So this is an environment agency um, priority species and one that we're trying to really eradicate in the UK. And even though it's small in size, so often the size of your finger, and you can see the comparison here against a key, and um, what they lack in size, they make up for in quantity. So they breed up to four times a year, which means they can rapidly reach really dense populations. Um, as you can imagine, they then outcompete other fish for food and habitat, disrupting the, the imbalance in the system. And they can be a host for non native parasites, as I mentioned earlier, which means that it might not harm this species, but can harm um, other fish kind of in the lake. And this is a photo here. It's taken from netting on one site where they removed 60 kilograms of tomato So Again, really highlights just the, the volume um, of these species that have been collected. And unfortunately, the only way to manage these species once they've been introduced is um, to rotenone the system. So that means obviously uh, closing the fishery uh, for that time being whilst it's been treated, which obviously has a huge economic impact on the, the system, uh, on the fishery itself. And I wanted to include this, uh, this photo, as you can see here, bottom left, just showcases actually how they can move around. So this one here, you can see there's actually a top of gudgeon within um, the mouth of the fish. And this is one where they can accidentally be spread from one location to another. And the second species I want to talk about is floating pennywort. I won't go into this in too much detail because it'll be covered by a talk later on. I really wanted to highlight the species because like a lot of aquatic plants, it re reproduces vegetatively, which means that you can have very small fragments the size of your thumb, the size of your fingernail, they can break off, get in your nets and the tread of your boots, and they can survive out of water, which means that you could unintentionally spread them from one water body to another, and then they can rapidly grow and result in these kind of impacts. So it's important for us um, to consider this and what measures we could do to try and stop them being spread from one water body to another. This brings me on to what can we do about it? Uh, and there's I've broken this up into three main um, areas so one biosecurity so as i mentioned trying to stop something from coming in the first place two learning how to id and then re importantly re report these species and three strategic management which uh, a lot of the talks will kind of be talking about later on firstly biosecurity what do i mean by this it's basically a term that means any measures that are being put in place to minimize the risk of invasive species being introduced or spread um, from one place to another and this has been encompassed in the Check Clean Dry campaign. So this came out of research that found that many invasive species, many plants, many animals, uh, think of killer shrimp, uh, floating penny water I just showed there, can survive over 14 days out of water in damp equipment. So if you think about yourself or your members, how often they might go fishing, often, if they're very lucky so, uh, once a fortnight. So actually they could accidentally be taking these species from one water body to another if they move between areas. But the same research also found that there is a really simple and effective way to kill off any of these species uh, that have been found uh, accidentally uh, in, in nets and on boots. And this is by implementing check, clean, dry. So it's very much as it says on the tin. First one is just checking, leaving any material, any plant material, animals, etc., mud that you find at uh, the site. Two, cleaning, this is a really important step, ideally using hot water, because this would kill off uh, the invasive species, they can't survive um, the, the high temperatures. If that's not available um, for any reason, using cold water under high pressure to dislodge a species, 
or use some disinfectant such as Vercon would also be um, the alternative approaches, but hot water is, is the most effective approach. And finally, drying. So leaving it uh, for 48 hours, if possible, 24 hours, out in sunlight, just to expose it to the sun and give it that final dry and that final whack, really, to kill off any species if they have stayed on or survived that clean stage. And this is also very important for fish diseases as well. So this is something that every individual angler can do, but also something that as fisheries you can communicate uh, to your members and your um, other people in the angling community. It's about what the individual angler can do, but this can also be adopted and encouraged by the club or fishery. So we have free biosecurity signs that we can send out to you to act as a visual prompt to your members. So that when they're coming to the site or leaving the site, they remember that they should be following this best practice. I'll come on to a bit later, but we also have funding available where you can install wash down stations. So it just means it's as practical as possible for them to do because they can do it when they are leaving the site and undertake that cleaning process. There's also um, potential that they don't have to be permanent. I know that this can be an issue with some places where they don't have access to electricity or to water, um, but you can create temporary ones if you're going to have a competition, for example, using pressure washers just to make sure you are um, helping anglers coming to those sites to undertake this to minimise the risk of any invasive species being introduced to that location, especially if they're coming for over the country. And also thinking back to that image of topmouth gudgeon, it's really important to consider the other areas of fisheries management that you're doing, such as fish stocking, if you're going to put in any floating islands, for example, where you're getting your plants from, just to make sure you're not accidentally introducing an invasive species as part of that. Next, we come on to ID and reporting. We're really lucky that we have access to these free ID guides on the non-native species sector website. So if you go onto their main page, you can see here the red arrow, click on ID sheets, and there'll be a whole drop down list in there these ID guides, you can either download them and print them off or you can just access it from your phone when out in the field if you think you come across something and want to ID it. Once you're confident how to ID a species, it's really important if you come across one to firstly report it to the fishery manager or the landowner, um, but also to make sure you report it uh, through iRecord. So this can be downloaded from the App Store or you can also uh, do it directly online by take a photo, note your location, upload it there. And this is really important, one, because when uh, the relevant individuals know the species there, they can more rapidly go out and try to control it and stop it spreading from elsewhere. But also, really crucially, it's important that we know where these species are so we know if they are spreading, how fast they're spreading, and also they can then go to the policymakers, highlight this to them and encourage more action to be undertaken on that particular species. And finally, I come on to management. I won't go into this in too much detail because we have some talks coming up that will be covering this, but just really wanted to highlight this as another option that I feel like the angling community is really well placed to get involved in, to try and control invasive species, to reduce the impact they're gonna have on fish and fishing, but also to try and stop them spreading into other areas. So there's an example here that I've included uh, from a strategy that's been developed on floating pennywort. And this is in line with uh, a big shift in recent years that's happening around invasive species management of recognising the importance of looking at catchment as a whole, um, making sure we're starting in the uppermost point of uh, where a species is found and working collaboratively to combine our resources, our knowledge to make sure we're, we are being as effective as we can as controlling this. So this is an example here um, on the right shows from the River Kennet between 2017 and 2020, where the Angling Club, Environment Agency and local stakeholders came together to tackle the species. And you can see the amazing difference that it had. Um, but there's also other projects going on on the Lee, on the Way, you can see here, um, work here on the bottom left from a working party that happened a few years ago. And it's been really great to see these different organisations coming together, sharing their knowledge to work to try and tackle these species. And this is something where I feel we can do more of and should get more of going, get more involved in going forward.
And it's quite good timing with this forum this evening because we actually have a round focused specifically on invasive species going live on Friday the 14th of April. And this funding offers the opportunity for clubs to apply for money up to 5k for a local project or up to 10k for a catchment project um, to purchase equipment um, or to send members on training courses such as herbicide courses to uh, control and tackle invasive species or to get money to install biosecurity uh, washdown facilities like I talked about earlier. So we actually have another forum on this on the 18th of April if you'd like to attend. I encourage all of you uh, here today just to look into that into more detail and if you want more information to contact our environment officers. So it's Drew Chadwick who covers the south and Ian Doyle who covers the north. Thank you. I think that gives a brief whistle stop tour on um, why we should care about these species, some of the impacts that they have and some of the work that we can do as an individual but also as fisheries and clubs to help tackle this and now uh, we'll pass you over to the other talks uh, to hear a bit more about what other stakeholders are doing in the area to tackle this important issue. Right, well thank you very much for that Emily. Um, I think that gives us a really good foundation to go and build on now uh, and thank you to all the people who have already asked questions as well. So I see there's a couple in there about Himalayan balsam, uh, which convenient that Himalayan balsam floating pennywort, which is conveniently the next topic that we're going to move on to. So, um, Neil, I'm just going to pull up your slides now, and we will dive straight in. Yeah, I'm unmuted now. Alex, can you oh. hear me? Okay? Yeah, yeah, loud and clear. Good. Right, so I'm just going to pull this up. Okay, so whenever you're ready, Neil. Okay, yeah, fine. Good evening, everyone. I'll try and embellish a little bit more on some of the um, information that uh, Emily just um, uh, passed on to us there. Um, so I appreciate that we probably have a bit of a mixed audience um, tonight, and some people probably have more knowledge and exposure to floating penny water than others. So obviously, I don't want to teach people to do this. Next slide. But I also need to make sure that everyone's up to speed and sort of like singing from the same hymn sheet, as it were. OK, next slide, Alex, please. Right, so floating pony water. This is, here's our target species, um, Hydrocotyl ranunculoides. It's both a native and an invasive, and they're both two very different things, as Emily alluded to. Um, Non-native refers to a plant or animal that may have been introduced directly or indirectly by man since the land bridge was severed between us and the rest of Europe after the last ice age as sea levels rose. Sort of a geological Brexit, if you wanted to know. Um, they don't have to be a problem, and many have become established. Our pheasants, rabbits, coloured doves, all familiar to us. They're not native. They've all been introduced and established quite happily. Um, and we may have lost some native species along the way, like wolf, bear, lynx, etc. Um, but invasives, um, they're the ones that can cause damage or harm to human health or to or environmentally or economically. Okay, next slide, please. So here's our target species out in the wild and where it escaped to since the early 1990s in all its light green glory. Um, it was originally brought in by the plant trade as an ornamental plant uh, to grace garden ponds or garden and estate ponds and it actually escaped from those into our main rivers. Uh, it looks innocent, innocent enough but um, so what problems and damage does it actually cause? Next slide please. As you saw in the previous slide it covers the surface of the water with quite dense thick rafts and these can sometimes be up to about two to three feet deep. As a result, they can completely shade out a water body, block out sunlight and uh, through the water column and uh, causing a change in temperature, can prevent submerged plants from growing. Uh, it can even reduce the um, dissolved oxygen content for in water, but uh, also it can hamper navigation 
and uh, water-based recreational activities such as angling. For me personally, it also can have the negative impact of causing biodiversity loss in which it excludes, it dominates and excludes on naturally occurring native wildlife. And of course, it is very, very expensive to get rid of. Next slide, please, Alex. So where it's come from? Well, it's come from a lot of people's garden ponds and estate ponds, but before that, it was uh, its natural habitat is down in Central and South Americas, although it does grow in Africa as well. Give you time to read what's up there as well. But um, next slide, please. And what makes it such a problem? Well, it's not native, so there's no natural predator or pathogen over here to keep it in check and our own native species haven't recognized it yet or adapted to it as such. And as we stated earlier, it can grow very, very rapidly. Um, it's peak season, it's high summer, of course, when we've got warmer temperatures and longer daylight hours. And we do have quite some um, nutrient rich waters um, here in the southeast as well, whether it's from agricultural runoff or sewage um, discharge, etc. And uh, so it has all the raw materials it needs in abundance to um, facilitate that growth. As Emily pointed out earlier, it spreads vegetatively over here. It um, and from any fragment that contains the node, uh, it's and it's about two thousand plus. 2,000 plus nodes every square meter in that plant. Um, it's filamentous as well, sort of. So it means it can break up very easily and spread in the flow. And it's not into sheep. But this picture was taken from a wet fence down in Pevensey uh, levels by one of the agency um, hierarchy. And uh, of course, animals don't recognize it as not um, covering water. It completely covers an area and we'll make it look like dry land. Next slide, please, Drew, uh, Drew uh, Alex. So what can we do about it? Um, there's been a number of methods tried and tested over the years, but there was never one sort of definitive method that was suited every location um, or every area. The, originally, it was um, phys physical and mechanical uh, removal which of course is very labor intensive, um, can be very expensive and the mechanical side relies on access as well. So there might've been access issues, um, sometimes overcome by splitting the rafts and drifting them downstream to an easier access point for removal. Then there was the chemical side, which is again, using herbicides. We are restricted in that regard because we've only got um, one active ingredient that's actually approved for use near water. And, um, it has to be applied by competent, suitably qualified sprayers. There are also legal constraints that have been introduced. There was a voluntary ban on the plant trade in 2005 to stop importing it or selling it. Um, that didn't work. And so that has actually become an actual legal ban in 2014 from selling it over the counter. And another reason, another well, another Another something we have in our armory in terms of our, our defense of our watercourses is to adopt um, really good, uh, robust biosecurity protocols as Emily was describing. Next slide, please. And it wasn't just um, an either and or sort of choice. A lot of areas um, worked on an integrated approach, um, basically combining a number of those methods just outlined. And it should be recognized that if you deal with floating penny wall in the early stages of the season, you're reducing the potential for it bulking up later in the year. So if you can start um, early on in terms of your uh, monitoring and action and reduce what you can in the spring months uh, onwards, 
the chances are that there's not going to be so much of it in the water body and for that to then grow exponentially um, and become a much bigger task later on. And next slide, please, Alex. So why have these methods not proven to be so effective? Um, yeah, there's, there's quite a few, really. Um, first of all, it's convincing landowners or riparian owners as well, that it's um, partly their duty of care. You can't allow uh, non-native invasive species to move from something that you own to someone else. And of course, that's very tricky with a river which has multiple owners and they're all connected in a downstream fashion. Um, so you're talking multiple owners and you're talking about um, allowing them to allow you access, if not um, to give you the opportunity or to deal with it themselves. There's also funding, uh, as we said, with the mechanical side of things, it can be quite expensive. And it's resource hungry. If you're doing it with volunteers, it's an ongoing process because it will replicate and spread, particularly when you've got a flow. Um, and there are means and ways, obviously, with a catchment based approach from going from upstream to downstream to actually try and have an, earth, an effective routine that is going to work for the catchment long term. But um, again, you're relying on people's availability and time. Poor so biosecurity has also contributed, um, accidental, mostly, most likely. I don't think anyone would be sort of deliberately transplanting it uh, elsewhere. But there's also not identifying and dealing with the source of the problem as well, where the penny water is actually its upper limit and where it's actually coming from. Next slide, please, Alex. Right, I'll, I'll, gloss, I'll gloss through these. Um, there's quite a lot of reading there, not such an exciting um, slide. But uh, we are restricted because we do have, as we said earlier, limited chemical options. Um, glyphosate itself, which is the active ingredient in a lot of herbicide products, is the only active ingredient that is permitted for use in or in close proximity to water. But again, it is still under review. Um, there are claims from some World Health Organization bodies that it's carcinogenic, um, not absolutely proven as yet. But there is also now other health um, issues that are being attributed to it in terms of how it affects the bacteria and the microbes in the gut of, um, of people in human health. So that is ongoing. Um, and there isn't another herbicide to replace it in sight in the pipeline. It's a very expensive process to put a new product forward and to get it through all the hoops it's got to dance through to be legally approved. Um, there are others like Diquat, which has been, uh, which was removed um, in 2006, but there's another variation of that which might be effective. And 2,4-D was always um, okay to use in water, but the actual manufacturers didn't apply for it to be used for that purpose in their license. So the other problems with using glyphosate as such is that um, it does take some time for the product to impact on the target plant. It takes actually three weeks um, as such, but, glyphos uh, but floating pennywort in its um, wonderful evolved state um, can, extract, can sort of extract it or excrete it within three or four days, which is why it's necessary to have a sticking agent in the mix of the product you use, whether it's actually in the formulation already or whether you add it to it in the, in the actual um, canister before you spray. Uh, the plant can register toxicity and shut down translocation for its system, therefore isolating the toxin and preventing it from causing further damage. And as we alluded to earlier, there was multiple apical buds within the plant in one of those dense, thick um, rafts. A meter square could easily have over 2000 nodes and they're resistant to herbicide. So let's look at the plant up close. Next slide, please, Alex. And here you can see in all its glory, the, the nodes, the buds, the rhizome roots um, close up. 
So what else could we be up against in our fight against floating pony walk? Next slide. Right, climate change uh, favours floating pennywort growth. It's going to make our uh, environment warmer and wetter. And since 2012, floating pennywort has unfortunately started to produce its own viable seed in this country. That's mainly in the south, in Cornwall, but with climate change, that could extend its range. The plant trade, bless it, has also started importing other varieties of floating penny warts, not the one that's banned. So there is an ongoing battle um, with that. Hopefully they're not as vigorous as the plant that we've had unleashed on us, which has been hybridized by full growth by the particularly by the plant trade, one suspects. Um, and the other thing that may concern us is that uh, floating penny wart is a nutrient scavenger. And while it might suck up a lot of the nutrients and metals, etc., in the water body, which may seem like a good thing for water quality, um, we might not be allowed to dump it on the riverbank once it's been pulled out to drain down because it might be more concentrated um, and seen as a reintroduction into the water body. That hasn't happened as yet, and hopefully it won't, but um, it's another thing to think about. The future, what's, 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 what good news can I give you? Um, next slide, please. And here it is. It's the weevil, um, mentioned in the title slide. Um, this is all about biological control. And this is um, Listronotus elongatus. This is um, a PTL mining fly. It lays its eggs in the PTL, as suggests, and the larvae feeds and buries itself into the plant, causing it big distress and for it to um, basically uh, fall apart and, and die. But um, the adults feed on the, the leaves. It doesn't eradicate um, the plant because that wouldn't be in its best interest but it does massively control help control and manage it and rein it in so it's not such rampant growth and it doesn't take over everything um, it could also be the angler's new best friend we started trials on this and for those that are not familiar with biological control this isn't environmental vandalism like um, imported the, the dutch bold fields imported harlequin ladybirds or the Australians had the cane toad, etc. In this country, we have a very rigorous, overly rigorous, rigorous um, procedure by which biological controls are presented to DEFRA and then to government for approval. So what you do is basically go back to the country's or origin and find out what pests and predators and pathogens are there which keep it in control or in in check and out of the number of hundreds of those you have to find one which is ex totally exclusive to the plant because you don't want it jumping off that and starting to eat our cereal crops or potato crops in this country if it runs out of floating penny wort. so you have to find a very specific um, species there was a number of candidates and they actually took it down to this particular one. We had pilot trials in the country in three different sites back in 2020, 21. And we were fortunate in the Southeast um, through the Cone Valley Fisheries Consultative and Tony Booker to get our foot in the door basically at CABI, which is the research um, arm organization that, uh, that works on the biological controls. And um, we released some on the River Colne. As I say, that was just a pilot and they seem to overwinter, but biological control is a very slow burner. It takes a year for a non-native species to basically acclimatize and then adapt and then to prosper in a different environment. So you're looking at a program of ongoing for about four or five years at least to work out whether it's going to be able to 
from a sustainable viable population in the wild where it's introduced and whether it's going to be an effective weapon working on our behalf because these weevils can reach parts that other methods can't reach they can go in underneath the bramble bush where it's caught up they can go under uh, sluices etc where people in boats and in waders can't get to so it's a long-term investment but it's more cost effective it is expensive at the moment it's costing us um, about 35k a year to um, continue our particular project down on the cone um, and that paid for last year 156 weevils introduced at four different locations so that's part of our trials in 2021 22 and 22 23 we continued the trials we've got funding now for two more years and the good news is that it seems to be working in the fact that they are starting to establish and they are starting to breed if they survive the winter and they get through the spring it's possible that they could have three breeding cycles during the during the summer spring summer months and um, by the end of the year so it's promising it's expensive and it's a limited supply um, because the cabbie have to import their weevils from Argentina and they have to then uh, quarantine them. They then have to cleanse them to make sure that they're not carrying any other um, pathogens or parasites on them, which could be harmful. Um, and then it's a controlled lease program where there's a lot of preparation and a lot of admin, I can tell you, to get it off the ground. But it's growing. There are lots of trials now around the country that are reporting back and we're monitoring the situation to see how um, how good it works. It's going to probably work better in some areas than others or in different types of rivers than others. Um, spatey rivers, purposely less so. Um, and until that time where they are out there and doing the job for us, we still need to contain um, fruit and pennywort in other areas. We still need to try and work on restricting the import of the plant which can cause such problems nationwide and if you can't get hold of any weevils as yet then you can do what my daughter did next slide please alex my final slide that's not my final slide that's my final slide she made her own that was for a school project in terms of how science is actually helping to help nature I guess I should leave it there. Well, thank you ever so much for that, Neil. Um, very, very, very interesting stuff, particularly on the weevil front there. I think, uh, yeah, we've already had a couple of questions in about weevils, which I hope, um, yeah, ad ad addresses those. Um, it's, uh, yes, yeah, it's been talked about for a long time. So great to see, great to see it in action and uh, having an impact down on the Colne Valley. So, um, yeah, absolutely fantastic to see it. And we've got one final segment coming up now from Josh. Um, so, Josh, I don't know if you're able to just share your screen now, pull up your slides. Yep, stand it now. How's that then? Oh, brilliant. I'll just put myself on mute and yet far okay so hearts middlesex wildlife trust have been um, controlling mink in the county um for uh, many decades and um i i started on this project um two and a half to three years ago now um with a focus on uh, water vault conservation and invasive non, well, the invasive non-native species side um, for my role has mainly been looking at mink control. And so I'm gonna take you through um, what the issues are and what we're doing to help and how um, anyone can have a part to play in helping to uh, create a mink-free Hertfordshire. And indeed, more than that as well. Okay, obviously this is not a mink, I should point out quickly. Um, and hopefully it's something that uh, many of you have seen before. This is a lovely water vole on uh, 
native um, mammal about the size of a guinea pig and uh, water voles are our fastest declining mammal um, but they well I, I thought I'd start with just a little video of uh, a clip of a water vole that we um, one of the ones that we reintroduced on the river Ver. and so you can see it's, it's a little pointed nose ears tucked into the fur beady eyes shorter tail than a rat and off it goes into the water um, and here's another one at uh, King's Mead. So you'll probably all be aware um, why I'm showing photos of um, videos of water voles. Um, because, well, the problem is that water voles are on the edge and are declining. Um, so huge, staggering declines in their form and distribution. Um, and, and this is studies um, between the uh, 80s and, and 90s. Uh, showing you know where, where the same er areas were surveyed and now um, now happens uh, annually uh, nationally um, so this this huge stark decline with lots of widespread local extinctions so just to highlight that in our county uh, this is pre-1990 records for water vole that the um, uh, Hearts Environmental Record Centre uh, holds and we're going to jump forward to um, the more recent years um, in the past sort of uh, six years here. So you can see this huge contraction um, in Hertfordshire. Go back and forward between those two, you can see um, the loss that we have had. So why is this? Well, of course, um, there are there are various factors, lots of lots of things always that are going to um, be affecting these things, but uh, with with um, habitat uh, degradation being a huge um, factor and with all the changes in our rivers and wetlands um, playing a key part, but a huge issue is uh, this, the American mink. So it is of course, an invasive non-native species, and I'm sure that most people here will be uh, will be aware of of mink. Um, they're a, they're a mustelid, so in the stoat and weasel family, and you can see the the dark fur um, and uh, well, about they're about the size of a, a, a ferret, roughly. There, the issue with mink is that they burrow into, well, they can fit into water vole burrows, uh, and also those of other riverine uh, wildlife, uh, so kingfishers, sand martins. Um, so a female moorhead, a, a female mink will set up a territory within usually the most wildlife rich area of a um, watercourse, uh, lake edge, and then throughout that season um, will deplete the wildlife will essentially feed all the wildlife in the area to her kits which can number you know 10 is uh, not unusual so um they they were introduced to the uk in the uh well in in the early to mid uh 20th century um where they were brought over for fur farming and through various means uh, they were they got into the wild um, and have now spread and become feral populations um, okay perhaps cute but very vicious as well um, and this is a mink uh, with a water vole um, or just predated a water vole. And this is what must have happened to, this is what has happened to um, literally uh, millions of water voles across the UK. Here is a mink that has climbed up a vertical bank into a kingfisher burrow. Um, and they are pretty uh, tenacious. They will go for animals a lot bigger than themselves. Uh, and I think that the heron won this this fight, um, but it's not always the case. Um, they are equipped with very sharp 
um, canines and claws, and they will, like stoats, um, ambush their prey. Uh, it's not only on the mainland they're an issue, but on um, UK islands um, where mink have got onto gannet trees. Um, here's a mink uh, <laughs> having a piggyback on uh, on a gannet uh, chick, but I don't think the gannet quite saw it that way. Um, so a huge issue, and then bringing it back to well, the reason that we're here. Um, depletion of, of fish stocks, uh, certainly attributable to mink as well. So in our, our area, um, we have most, these are mink sightings in the past, uh, over the past couple of years. And um, it's not showing numbers, it's just showing locations. So Stort Valley is, is a key area, as, as is the rivers on the, uh, around the Tring reservoirs, um, also North Hearts, but a few recently have been caught over on the upper Mimram. And this one in the middle, um, north from Hatfield, was a sighting around Stamborough, uh, Reed Marsh, um, a couple of years ago. Okay, so what exactly are we doing about all this? Well, the um, Game and Wildlife Conservancy uh, designed a raft um, that has sort of turned into this sort of design. It's um, many of you will, will have uh, seen these, I'm sure. Uh, floating platform uh, moored to the bank, and there's a, a tunnel which mink can enter through. Inside the tunnel, there's a a, a, a tray um, that's touching the water, so absorbs the water onto a clay surface. And the clay um, will essentially take track the prints of the uh, animals that walk through. So we're able to know um, whether mink are around. And using this method, we can see that uh, if mink are, are around, then the, the uh, track can be placed inside the tunnel um, and the mink will be caught. Here are some, um, I would say, lovely mink prints. Um, I like a good print. But, you know, this is, yeah, it's not, not good when you find them. Uh, but it's good to know that the mink has found the raft and you've got some hope of getting rid of them. However, in recent years, we've been um, trialling and moving forward with using these um, smart traps. So it's a, a special device, and these are, these are manufactured by Remoti, these ones, um, which sits on top of the trap. The trap is like a long squirrel trap, basically. And when the door closes uh, with, of the trap, uh, this magnet gets pulled off and the device will send a message to uh, selected recipients. So meaning that the trap doesn't need to be checked um, every day uh, as required by law. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's better for the animal because they will stay in, in, in uh, court for, for less time as well. This is the current distribution of these uh, remote smart traps um, in, within rafts across Hertfordshire. Um, and so we're always looking for more locations and uh, landowners to take on board these things. Um, there have been a few more dots added to this map since then. Um, but you'll notice the reintroductions that were done on the ver here. It's the water vol reintroductions. Um, and um, on the bean um, over here, uh, where we've got some clusters of, of rafts. And when mink are, are sighted, um, we do uh, add rafts in as quickly as possible. Um, and in most cases, they're caught um, within you know, a few weeks' time. Um, however, yeah, we haven't had many mink in the past few years. But what sort of numbers are we talking about? If you have a look at the recent trend since 2011, um, when, when we started uh, more diligently recording the mink captures, you can see this peak around 2013 um, of around 40 mink per year, and then the gradual decrease down. And so 
it seems like in hearts we're at a low ebb on mint control which is a great thing and it's meant the work of the trust um uh, so so um has has uh, helped to control the species um however um controlling mink uh, is not enough for obvious reasons it's like any of these invasive species if left they will come back uh, with a vengeance so having a litter of eight a year for example a female mink you know and all the all those young will disperse if they're not caught they'll be breeding themselves within a year or two and you can see how the problem can escalate and how water voles and other wildlife um, can continue to be under threat. So um, we're working with Water Life Recovery East, um, which is a, 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 um, a group of uh, concerned bodies who are working towards a mink-free East Anglia. The flashing little dot there, that is quite annoying, sorry, is, um, is Hartford, or around Hartford. See the edge of Hertfordshire here. Um, so they have the core area in which they're trying to demonstrate that uh, it's possible to achieve a mink for East Anglia. And, um, well, let's look at Cambridgeshire, which is in the buffer area. And this is a similar trend um, that they're finding across um, Norfolk and Suffolk too. So in uh, at the start, with uh, when, when traps are first put out, um, they're catching loads and loads of mink, especially at the peak times of year, uh, around, well, January to March, uh, and then um, at, when, when um, animals are moving around um, looking for mates, and then again in, uh, well, late summer, uh, mid to late summer, there's a bit of another peak when the young um, start to move around in their family groups. Um, but yeah, so this trend is something that they're, they're seeing. So even with an increasing trapping effort, uh, fewer and fewer mink were being caught. Uh, this is just the example from Cambridgeshire. Norfolk and Suffolk were the same. Um, and so um, now I think there have been only one, possibly two captures of mink in the core area shown on this map um, in, since spring last year, which is absolutely remarkable, um, showing that the, this collaborative effort um, between all the partners, landowners, uh, angling clubs has been paying off to not just control mink, but eradicate mink. So this is a, this is a map um, of, of all um, smart trapping uh, stations that are around. So it's very much bigger than just us in Hertfordshire um, with our, our uh, 60 traps that we have. Uh, we're part of this much bigger group and protecting the core area. Water Life Recovery East are now expanding to the Water Life Recovery Trust, of which, um, of course, we are uh, a partner um, organization. And so um, we're, we're doing our bit uh, to essentially achieve a mink free UK. And let's face it, you know, we are an island and we will be able to, um, it is possible to get rid of mink. And so the pilot in the core area of this uh, has, has certainly shown that it's possible. There's some really interesting science that I wanted to touch on. Um, I hope you'll find it of interest too. But all the um, mink that are caught are, um, well, they're, they're shot and the, uh, an ear sample is taken. Um, so for DNA, this DNA is um, sequenced by um, um, academics at Cambridge University. And they've discovered that um, essentially mink have uh, certain, within their DNA, certain characteristics or um, the bookmarks that you can pick out and, I, and, and say that this mink has likely come from this area based on um, the previous, all the previous mink that have been sampled. So essentially, what, what, what the, all the previous data from these hundreds and hundreds of mink has, has got, got is we're able to get this target shape um, and this bullseye, which shows like 90% likelihood that the mink came from this spot. And the red dot here shows where the mink was caught. This is remarkable genetics, and it will help us to identify 
um, where mink have come from and, um, and, and be able to help uh, focus our efforts, um, particularly between uh, catchment areas and uh, trapping groups. Um, other than just mink, um, uh, folk mink control and eradication, uh, we do train um, folks to uh, survey for water voles. Um, and I just wanted to mention that because it may be something of interest to um, your clubs. Um, because clearly, as with mink, as with any of these species we're talking that anyone's mentioned tonight, it's only the records that we get um, that we'll be able to act on them. Uh, so, so surveying for water voles will be key, and we can also target, help to target mink um, control around high water vole population areas. Um, or, or any waterfall population areas, or um, or you know fisheries as well. So we're very happy to get involved with that. So uh, what now? Well, we're going to carry on extending our mink monitoring and control. So this is the key thing. Please do get in touch with me um, if you want. Uh, if you could take a smart raft, um, I'll show you how they work, and um, keep you up with all the uh, necessary equipment. Um, we want to get water voles back on every river in Hertfordshire by 2030. So do let us know if, if you're a landowner or you know someone who could host a potential reintroduction. That would be great. We're always looking for um, more sites um, to do that. We'll continue to monitor water voles at key sites and also our reintroduced populations. So if you want to train as a surveyor um, either to survey those key sites um, or simply to be able to monitor water voles on your patch of um, river or wetland, then uh, also get in touch. And finally, yeah, as I've mentioned, please do share any uh, mink and water vole records as it's uh, of um, utmost importance. And I'll finish with this little video of a couple of water voles um, fighting over a bit of apple on the Vera introduction. So that was probably the first sound of a water vole Sploshing in the in the river ver, um, in probably over thirty years. There we go. That's it. <laughs>